everybody. Welcome back. I guess it's about time we should get started. I'm moderating the last session. My name is Sridharan Vishwanath. My colleague, uh, Professor Sanjay Shakutai, had a personal emergency happen, and so he's unable to be here. He sends his regrets. But, uh, you know, we have roughly similar sounding names, Sridharan Vishwanath, anyway. Uh, and, and in terms of job description, we do uh, very similar things. I'm also in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. I'm also a professor there. And our re my research is in the domains of information theory, networks, communications, and systems. So it is my pleasure to be here uh, to welcome speakers and panelists in the last session titled Improved Traffic Operations in a Connected and Automated World. Um, there's a heavy emphasis, if you look at the mix of speakers, <coughs> um, on what a, lo a lot of was motivated earlier on today, which is uh, building a completely connected uh, beyond Internet of Things, but it's mobile static, all working together in a uh, ubiquitous communication paradigm. So, uh, in terms of speakers, our first speaker is uh, going to be Todd Hemmingson. Todd is the Vice President of Strategic Planning and Development at Capital Metro, and I'd like to welcome him to talk uh, about technology improved service quality. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Saram. Thank you all for uh, letting me come talk to you today. And I know it's the last panel, which is probably second worst to the panel right before lunch. Uh, but I'll try to keep this relatively interesting. And um, my topic today, as you can see on the slide there, is Metro Rapid Transit Signal Priority and Using Technology to Improve Service Quality. So hopefully you all are familiar with Metro Rapid which is a, our premium bus service at Capital Metro. We've launched uh, this past year. And when we put this plan together back in actually around 2008, and we're going to pursue federal funding, which we were fortunate enough, enough to receive, we actually ended up getting about $38 million, uh, or 80% of the cost of this project from the feds, which is the largest grant the agency had ever received to that point. We put together kind of our purpose and uh, benefits. And as you can see on the screen there, our objectives were higher quality, faster, more frequent, reliable transit for major travel corridors. And we came up with a plan that simply put form to X that ended up serving four of the major corridors in Central Austin and, and four of the uh, most transit ready, transit supportive corridors. You can see in red there that Route 801 is our North Lamar, uh, excuse me, to South Congress line. That's our longest line, um, beginning at our park and ride on the north on I-35 and then extending all the way south to Slaughter Lane and I-35. The second line that we opened in August of this past year is Route 803, and that one runs from the domain area and the Pickle Research Campus up on Burnett Road. And then in the X, um, you'll notice they run a common shared path through the central core of downtown by UT, by the state capitol complex, and then it through downtown Austin. And then this line goes uh, south, down South Lamar to the Westgate area. Where we're working right now with TxDOT uh, to develop a new park and ride underneath 290 there so we can have more accessibility for this route. So uh, we identified again the purpose and the benefits and if you look at both of those and then think about transit signal priority which I'll define in just a moment, all of these words tie into transit signal priority and transit signal priority can help the agency and help our service achieve the purpose and the benefits goals and objectives basically for this service. So on our system to date, we have delivered more than one million trips. We just hit that number uh, last month. And we're up to almost about 10,000 trips per weekday on both of these uh, routes combined. Some of the other attributes briefly, they run at very frequently every 15 minutes all day, every, about every 10 minutes, every 12 minutes in the 
morning and afternoon peak period. They have less uh, frequent stops than our other routes, so the stops are spaced further apart, which helps them move more quickly. Now they have multi-door boarding. We have real-time passenger information at the stops. They have the unique stops as well as the unique vehicles. And then they do have the transit signal priority uh, treatment on them. But as you'll see, we have some lingering challenges. The on-time performance is not as good as we had hoped which is partly a function of the congestion in the, in the four corridors we're serving. And when we modeled these back in 2008, since that time in that relatively short period, the congestion levels on these four corridors has gone up significantly, as well as the number of developments. So our travel times ended up being longer than, than we had anticipated. So as we were designing the project, we wanted to use technology in multiple, multiple ways to make the service operate uh, better. One of those was transit signal priority, or TSP as we call it. But to get TSP, we don't own the, or operate the traffic signals. Capital Metro is an independent entity from the city of Austin. And we have to work closely with the city for uh, things like TSP to come to fruition. So we really undertook a multi-year effort with them. They had what was called an Opticom system for their emergency vehicles, which is basically a, a, a emitter on the emergency vehicles that would communicate to the traffic signals so they could get what's called preemption. Uh, that means basically no matter what happens, if they send that signal, the light changes immediately, they go through. That can really mess up the entire traffic signal system for a number of minutes. So the city was not keen to give all our buses that kind of treatment, but they were keen on upgrading their system. And so they realized there were some benefits to a partnership that included uh, funding from Capital Metro. Some of that grant money ended up going into this project. Um, so we developed an agreement to fund it. The city installed it. We worked closely with them. We had consultants on board to help us do that. And we did testing and de deployment and we fortunately got it all done in advance of the launch of Metro Rapid. So where are we using it today? Um, on these four corridors that I've mentioned, but one of the benefits of the system-wide upgrade we did with the city is that we have the ability now to deploy TSP basically anywhere else in their signal system throughout the city of Austin. So what is it? Um, it's a, Textbook definition is an operational strategy that facilitates the movement of transit vehicles through traffic signal controlled intersections. And the objectives are to improve schedule adherence, our travel time efficiency, and, to min and um, important for the traffic engineering side is to minimize the impact to everybody else that's using the roadway. And then importantly, as I mentioned, it is not signal preemption. And that we learned uh, the hard way, if you mention that phrase to traffic engineers, or at least some traffic engineers, they get very excited in a hurry. So we learned it's signal priority and not preemption. Uh, simply put, this is the way it works. It's just uh, all these things work together. Now, I'll just put this up for fun. You can't read it, I know. Um, but it is a complex system, and I don't pretend to be an expert in it. So just to show you that I don't understand it entirely, I just said, this is how it works. But there are four main components. It's a detection system that lets, or a detect, yeah, that lets the, the signal priority system know where the vehicle is. So we spent the last seven years, I hate to admit, installing a comprehensive system throughout our fleet of, put it basically, GPS units on every bus with an automatic vehicle location system. Um, which just last week you may have heard, <laughs> we finally deployed real-time information system-wide. So now if you have an, one of an, our apps or another app, we have it out on open data uh, so other developers can use it, but you can now see where all our buses are across the system in real, t uh, almost real-time within a minute or so. So then we, we let the traffic system know where we are then we send a request if we meet certain conditions. So there's business rules that we developed with the city that say when and when not uh, to make that, to grant the request. So every time our bus is approaching 
signalized intersection with Metro Rapid, it'll make the request, then the business rules apply, and it'll either say, okay, we'll grant it or we won't grant it. Uh, that's basically this step. And then on the back end, we have a system that's collecting huge amounts of data now. We know all of these things that are happening and collecting uh, information on where the bus is in real time again, whether the actuation occurred, how the bus flow is happening, what the average speed is, all kinds of data. But one of our challenges, as you'll hear, is our ability to analyze that has, is not quite as good as I wish it was. So how's it working? Well, this description to apply um, kind of represents part of the view is you have transit engineers and traffic engineers, and this can be what happens. Um, but I kid in part, it's not really that bad. We have had some challenges. We, being on the transit side, want to push or punch. Um, for more, we want more. We want more transit priority. We want more benefits for transit. We want our buses to get through traffic more efficiently and effectively. And then on the traffic engineer side, that's the city of Austin primarily. They're more balanced in their view. They want to make sure that automobile traffic and transit can work together. Um, so really how's it working? Well, what we know today is that on an average weekday, we're having about 20, anywhere from 2,400 to 26 to 3,000 what we call check-in. So that's when the bus approaches the signal, sends that I'm here message, and then the, the, uh, the TSP system does the business rule processing. And what we're seeing now is that only about, um, well, just about 15% of the time, I suppose, maybe 20% of the time, we're seeing the green extension granted. So that means the business rules are saying most of the time, sorry, you don't meet the conditions. So you're either not at the right point in the signal phase, um, you, you're too far away from where the signal is when it's about to turn <coughs> red, and we can't hold it for more than a certain number of seconds, which I think is about uh, six seconds, or other factors, you basically don't qualify. And so, so again, what we're seeing is only less, well under half the time are we actually getting a green extension. One of the other things we've learned and seen and experienced is that in peak hour congestion, this system doesn't really provide a whole lot of benefit. It ha there has to be enough uh, flow through the system to get the bus to the signal in time. If it's stop and go bumper to bumper, then TSP probably isn't going to be of much help. And so we are looking at other ways to help our buses get through traffic. So where are we headed? Um, basically, on our to-do list is to really dig down into this and get a much better understanding of how the system's working and what we can do to optimize it. Uh, so that includes analyzing, and this is where I was talking with Chandra, we need to work, well, I want to, I have a goal to work with UT and the Center for Transportation Research to help us with this. And we do have a agreement <coughs> with CTR that we can issue task orders and do work, some of which we're already doing, but this is one that I think is ripe for the brain power at UT to help us understand this. Because again, we have reams of data, but we don't have the resources internally to really dig to mine that data and understand it. So these are some of the things we've thought of that we really want to understand better. When are the requests occurring by all these various attributes? And then when we get activations, what are the attributes associated with that? Why were they being denied in some cases? Uh, uh, importantly, the, then between our two routes, the 801 and the 803, is there any significant variation? Is one getting a lot more signal priority than the other, for example? And then uh, one of the things we've talked about with possibly with a consultant is to have them put together a kind of a dashboard for us so we can really monitor this on an ongoing basis to see how it's working and what we can do to make it better. So just in conclusion, our successes, I think this is the first time that transit signal priority has ever been deployed in Central Texas. 
Um, so with this Metro Rapid project, we had a lot of firsts. It's the first time we ever <coughs> had tran uh, transit priority lanes in Central Texas or Austin. Um, the signal priority also a first. We managed to get it installed, tested, and implemented on time. And uh, actually, our, the overall project came in $8 million under budget on a $47 million budget. And so one of the things we're doing is working with the Federal Transit Administration to try to get the remaining <coughs> funds um, to buy some additional vehicles and add some more stations in some of those areas that have developed since we planned them originally a number of years ago. And then some of the challenges and opportunities. Well, as I mentioned, a detailed analysis of the operations is lacking. That's what we really need. It's on our to-do list, uh, but we've had some resource availability uh, challenges for that analysis and optimization work. And uh, my subtle hint here was the partnership with academic institutions, preferably the one based in Austin and not that one in College Station. Uh, and no, um, that's because I did go to UT. Um, and then again, how do we augment or improve, optimize whatever word you want to choose um, to the TSP system to help us further improve our metro rapid performance. The other thing we want to do is content now that we have the GPS system and the automatic vehicle location system wide, is we can start to and do analysis on all of our routes and identify certain locations where we know we're getting bogged down and then go to the city, we'll have the data where as before this point, it was just anecdotal primarily, we could say based on our observations, now we'll have the data we can go to them and say, we know that at this intersection from this time to this time we're seeing significant delays, can we get signal priority here? So um, that's kind of what uh, we've been working on and again, some of our successes and challenges. And that's what I have for you all today. Thank you for your time and attention. And not sure if you want to take questions now or at the end of the panel. Um, at the end of the panel. OK. Very good. Thank you very much. So I didn't realize we were li really lucky today because all three of our panelists are UT Allens. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Our second panelist is Tom Novlo. Tom is a star staff research engineer at Samsung Research America and got his PhD in the wireless group uh, WNCG at the University of Texas, Austin. <coughs> Thank you, Shiram. Yes, uh, I'm very honored to be here today as a uh, proud friend of Alec. And um, I would like to talk to you guys a little bit today about uh, vehicle-centric wireless communications. And we've had some great talks earlier in this morning about some of the opportunities for critical safety using DSRC and potential new applications using millimeter wave, as well as some of the data processing challenges um, that we might experience. And so I want this talk to be a little bit of a synthesis of those ideas and look at the kind of technology roadmap for making um, that a reality. And uh, first, let me a little, introduce a little bit um, my research center. So I work at the Samsung Research America in Dallas. Um, we're about 100 research engineers, mostly PhDs, who are working um, broadly on a couple different topics. One is wireless communications. Another is um, software. Another is emerging devices and applications. So for example, um, you might have seen some recent press rele releases about uh, millimeter wave 5G from Samsung. A lot of the hardware and RF was uh, developed by us in Dallas. Um, also, if you've seen some of the announcements about this uh, virtual reality headset, the Gear VR, that was developed um, by our team in, in Dallas. So we have a lot of innovation going on. And uh, one of the areas that we're increasingly interested in is uh, vehicles and uh, the associated uh, opportunities there. So Samsung makes a lot of stuff. If you guys look very carefully at the bottom of the slide, you'll see many different things. There's a refrigerator, a cell phone, base station. I found out at one point we actually used to make cars. Um, <laughs> there's not much that Samsung doesn't make. And so um, as a result, you know, we're very interested in when uh, technology converges. And we think um, the vehicle is one of those opportunities. Um, there was a quote that one of the most sophisticated technology um, that, that people own these days is their vehicle. And um, so much is centered around the vehicle now. And when we talk about vehicle communications, we kind of categorize it in three areas, a vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infra infrastructure, 
and also vehicle pedestrian. And uh, there's many different use cases, whether it's um, providing safety, some type of telematics, navigation, all these functions come together and they all fundamentally require communication links. So as a result, you don't just have a, a single system or a single provider, you have an ecosystem. And uh, broadly, you can think of it as three parts. You have um, the software, and uh, recently we saw big announcements from um, both the two major mobile operating systems, Android and iOS, about their uh, interest in uh, going into the vehicle and the partnerships with uh, different vehicle manufacturers and uh, device manufacturers. Um, so software is key, that's the interface, that's the connection to the user, but on running on top of the software, there has to be hardware. And uh, as a result, there are now alliances and uh, consortiums building around uh, hardware for the connected vehicles. One example is MirrorLink, that's something that Samsung has partnered in um, with uh, other um, device manufacturers where basically they're looking at a way of bringing in the, de the devices that the user already has, whether it's their phone or tablet, and integrating it into the vehicle. Um, and that requires a level of, of, of certification, level of security and trust and authentication that's a required interface between the software and hardware. And then finally, uh, there needs to be some type of network that either is uh, managing traffic or managing the, 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 the services um, that are being provided. And uh, so there's you know, um, large operators like AT&T, Verizon said they're very interested in, in the vehicle space. And uh, network vendors like Cisco, um, we, we know, are also very interested. So this ecosystem has a lot of uh, uh, pieces that need to connect and uh, work together. Um, and so we have to think, are we ready for this type of, of, of innovation? What's, what's the roadmap? Um, one of the greatest things right now is um, there's been huge advances in the mobile radio processor implementation to get you know, very complex uh, normally what you would have running on your desktop hardware running on your small smartphone. And now that can be leveraged. And also, um, we're moving away from very um, hardware-centric implementations to more software upgrade-friendly um, implementations, which is very good due to kind of long product cycles we typically see in the vehicle industry. And just for example, you can see on the left there, that's kind of as described this morning, what was required to have some type of vehicle communication set up all those different boxes and uh, now um, Qualcomm announced last year they have um, eight different technologies um, running on their uh, Gobi platform, including LTE, 80211, DSRC. So all this can be, uh, can be implemented um, and uh, is, uh, the ecosystem, I think, is ready. But still, we need to have collaboration across the ecosystem. Um, it takes a lot of work to go from R&D. Um, here we are showing uh, actual drive test data from Samsung in Korea where they were able to show using millimeter wave frequencies uh, 1.2 gigabits per second link um, at 111 kilometers per hour. Um, but that's an R&D controlled setup. So taking that to an actual integration requires standardization um, and also requires partnerships between the different manufacturers and software providers. So that's where um, standardization is key and um, Although I'm focusing on vehicles, um, Samsung is of course interested in the broader what you want to call connected things or internet of things. And many of the issues we see in these uh, vehicle centric um, applications is also there in general for the IoT. And one of those is the need to interconnect. You have different devices, um, you, know, you want them to, to be able to, to communicate with other devices that may be using different standards um, at the physical layer, the air interface. Um, maybe at the higher layers, you want to have some ability for them to communicate, whether they're going over the internet or over private networks. So as a result, um, many companies are looking at these uh, type of uh, connectivity frameworks for devices. And one um, that Samsung is involved with is called the Open Internet Consortium that they re actually released their op first version of their open source code in 2014. And the goal was to provide a way for devices to discover each other learn about their capabilities and connect um, in a very secure but still seamless uh, manner. So we expect to see a lot more of these type of consortiums going forward where you have multiple standards that now need to work together. So what is required to have this type of um, ecosystem? Um, there's many building blocks and uh, depending on what layer you're looking at, uh, you have different uh, mission objectives. So at the fundamental layer for a communication link, we have to have a physical layer which sends the bits over the air interface and a, some type of 
MAC or access protocol. Um, there's multiple different ways of doing that. We discussed uh, 802.11, um, DSRC, LTE is also increasingly being used to provide this type of connectivity. Then we go up a higher layer and we have this uh, network or application layer. And that's where we have to decide how to manage multiple links because a vehicle may be have, having five or six different links uh, going concurrently. All that needs to be managed somehow on the, on the car as well as in the network. And so there needs to be routing protocols and data management there. And then at the high level, we're seeing now that regulator, um, regulatory bodies are really interested in developing a framework and making sure that um, all the component building blocks uh, work together. And of course, their primary focus is on safety and interoperability, but uh, when we think about vehicles, we're not just thinking about safety applications, we're thinking about the broader opportunities for new services as well. So what are some of the technical challenges for V2X for communication links? And I think some of them were discussed earlier, but we can think of them in three categories. The first is access. So unlike the traditional kind of cellular links we've been thinking about, um, Vehicles have uh, specific topology characteristics that make them very challenging. Um, for example, you can have very large node density variations depending on what time of day or geographic location. Um, and the link, link lifetimes may be very short. Um, so you may be able to manage a certain set of vehicles for a few seconds and then a totally new set of vehicles becomes part of your management set. So it's a very complex problem to uh, be able to manage, you need to have distributed and centralized features in your network to handle that, which means uh, we don't know what is the optimal architecture until we deploy it, and that's one of the big challenges right now. Um, do we need to deploy more base stations to support this? Um, for the vehicles, you know, is the existing technology um, going to be sufficient? Is it going to scale? Are we gonna have issues with uh, interference? Um, are we gonna have issues with um, making sure control data can be prioritized? All of this has to be uh, well understood at the architecture level, as well as the, the physical layer. And finally, we were supporting new applications that traditionally we weren't supporting before on these networks. For example, extremely low latency, although the data size may be very small. Or we may have very high data rate applications where the mobility is very large. Both of those are typically not been um, something we've optimized before in our networks. So, um, one roadmap which I want to discuss is 3GPP. Um, that's the kind of global body that's uh, in charge of most of the cellular standards out there, um, for example, LTE. And uh, I want to show this roadmap and show how the building blocks are being formed to build the uh, vehicle communication system and that uh, this approach is saying, let's not uh, build kind of a standalone system, but let's take different pieces that were used for different applications and, and integrate it and in the end, we can use these multiple different uh, technologies to provide an overall VTX system. So the first building block that was actually put in place uh, in 2014 is the device-to-device -device communication for LTE. And uh, the two major features were network-assisted or ad hoc broadcast communication and a very power efficient and scalable device discovery. And when I mean scalable, I'm talking about thousands of devices within you know, only a small few millisecond window of, of communication airtime. And uh, this was uh, designed for both public safety and commercial applications. And one of the major commercial applications cited is vehicle um, safety applications where you want to discover devices around you and send secure communication. Second area which is on, ongoing in the current release of LTE is um, what's called machine type communication or MTC. And here we're taking the you know, basic LTE standard and uh, optimizing it for specific uh, IoT applications. So one of the drawbacks of LTE is that you know, it's a, a very expensive chipset relative to other technologies. Um, but many of those features are because um, you know, we're targeting smartphones which have high processing capabilities and we're targeting high data rate. But for certain applications, um, I, in IoT you may have smaller data rate app um, applications, you may um, you know, not care so much about all the bandwidth that needs to be supported. And so then you can really lower the cost of the device while still running the underlying LTE protocol. And this uh, provides, you know, a lot of uh, scalability because the chipset manufacturers can provide a, a single ch uh, chipset and uh, just reduce some of the features um, targeting a certain application, which uh, vehicles may be one of those applications. And then finally, uh, standardization has already started and will um, really uh, kick off next year in 2016 
for vehicle to X over LTE. And here we're optimizing some of the biggest challenges that we saw using uh, traditional technologies by having massive scale resource allocation with low overhead. So making sure if you know you have thousands of users um, sending data um, about you know their location or um, you know trying to do traffic management, you can send that data with uh, the lowest overhead possible, and it's extremely scalable from a network point of view. While also targeting vehicular speeds and ensuring that. Uh, critical control messages that have low latency are well supported. So putting these building blocks together is one way that uh, a, a um, technology like LTE may be well suited for entering into the vehicle space. And finally, uh, a lot of us have been hearing about 5G. Um, that's a big part of my world. Um, when will 5G come? Uh, what will 5G look like? Um, I can share Samsung's view, so recently, um, Samsung unveiled this uh, rainbow of requirements for 5G. So 5G is not just about increasing data rate. It's also about providing uh, ubiquitous coverage so that no matter where you are, you're getting uh, the same data rate speeds. There's no such thing as a cell edge anymore. You have uh, com uh, coverage, whether you're um, in an urban area or at the, at the edge of the air, um, area. Uh, latency, pushing it down to one millisecond. So that's the, the target. And uh, that's not just for vehicles, that's for many other critical applications that require low latency, especially um, virtual reality or um, applications where you require some type of um, user control in real time. Um, since it's one umbrella technology, you have flexible support for your multiple modes, whether you're doing vehicle or infrastructure or just regular device to device communication, it's all under the same protocol, all under the same network. And um, also, because we're moving to new spectrum bands like millimeter wave, we'll have the ability to provide extremely high data rate services. Of course, there's many challenges for making this 5G uh, reality. Um, one is uh, understanding the right uh, network architecture, architecture, whether we have a centralized architecture or a distributed architecture, um, how much data actually needs to go over the network, um, how the data is managed is especially critical for V2X. Um, there's many challenges from a hardware RF point of view. Um, and then uh, finally, you know, who will manage this infrastructure and how should it be deployed? So those are some of the critical questions that we hope to be able to address and, with 5G and keeping in mind vehicle-centric communications. So that's all I have. Um, I really appreciate it and uh, look forward to any questions you may have during the panel. Thank you. not the least is Professor Stephen Boyles. Oh. Uh, he's the assistant professor in civil architecture and environmental engineering at UT Austin and also a UT alum. Thank you. So thank you to everybody for making it all the way through the day. This is the, the last talk in the, in the last session. And what I'm going to try to do is to just talk about you know, the, you know, the far future, maybe not, maybe not as far as we would think, um, but looking at kind of automation you know, at, its, at its fullest extent. We've seen a lot of talks earlier today that started um, even with you know, transportation 100 years ago, going from um, horses and people scooping manure on South Congress um, up, up, and th up through you know, earlier cars, and we're seeing nuts and bolts about things that could be used for automated vehicles in the future. And what I'm going to talk about today is a bit of a vision for um, um, a world which is much more fully autonomous than what we have today, and the kind of models that we can use even now to, um, to try to guide policy to try to determine what makes sense, um, how these kinds of decisions should be made. So I mean, I'm going to this, you know, this, this vision of a fully autonomous vehicle um, that doesn't require human interaction at all. And since going back to one of these pictures from the 50s that we saw uh, you know, very early this morning, uh, where you've got the family that can play games while they're, while they're traveling, um, no, intera no interaction is uh, required at all. Um, and so as we've been talking about all day, there's plenty of tremendous opportunities that that this technology can bring um, in terms of safety, in terms of Im reducing congestion, um, in terms of improving mobility for uh, people who are older or younger. Um, there's a lot of opportunities uh, for, for improving the way that transportation is done. And 
also, I think by now people have become convinced that this actually is happening. It's, and it's fascinating how quickly this has happened. Um, in political science, there's a term called the Overton window, which is used to describe, you know, these are the range of ideas which are considered, you know, okay, these are reasonable ideas to have, and things outside this window are just considered far-fetched and just kind of a pipe dream. And it's fascinating how quickly this window has shifted on autonomous vehicles. Even just a year or two when I would present this to audiences, I would have to give a few slides to defense of, you know, no, seriously, this is going to happen. And, um, and you know, telling people that most of the components have actually been here for a long time. Um, if you've got anti-lock brakes, there's a computer controlling the brakes. If you've got cruise control, there's a computer that can control your throttle, um, so on and so forth. And trying to convince people that you know, the nuts and bolts are mainly there. Well, nowadays, I think, at least for most of the people in this room, um, you know, we're, we're okay with that. You know, we're coming to the point where we realize that this is something which is, is coming, coming and happening in the foreseeable future. Um, and perhaps, in my opinion, the, you know, the, the bottleneck for putting this into practice is going to be less so technology and more so policy types of questions about liability, about regulation, um, about infrastructure provision, whether that will happen uh, from the public sector, the private sector, and so on. Um, and so what this means is that I think there's no better time to actually start the conversations about seriously how can we plan for these? What are the different possibilities? Um, what are the different eventualities? Um, because people are getting excited, they realize this can happen, and also, of course, the best time to plan is before the problems actually arise. Um, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, a lot of times in the transportation profession, we end up kind of reacting to problems after the fact, but now we've got an opportunity to actually be proactive and, and plan uh, for, for autonomous vehicles. So, yes, there are tremendous opportunities in terms of mobility, in terms of congestion. There are also some challenges, and Chandra alluded to these in his talk, uh, which he gave in the morning, where, okay, perhaps this can make travel more efficient, this can provide mobility to people who don't currently have access, but maybe that will induce a lot of extra demand. You know, that may swamp some of the benefits we see um, in increasing capacity. Okay, maybe it'll be safer, um, but, you know, again, as Chandra said, sometimes making things safer doesn't always mean that, you know, people won't respond in a way that counteracts some of that. Um, an example that I like to give is with cyclists and bike helmets. There was some fascinating research done a couple of years ago um, that showed that if a cyclist is wearing a helmet, drivers will pass them much more closely than if they're not. And you know, if someone's not wearing a helmet, drivers perceive it as a dangerous situation and they give the cyclist a wide berth put a helmet on the cyclist, and all of a sudden the driver doesn't see it as dangerous, and they pass them much, much more closely than, than they did before. Um, and Google has seen some of this happen with their, with their Google cars and the hundreds of thousands of miles they've logged. Some people have realized that this is a car that can respond very, very quickly and with a very high degree of probability. I can cut it off in traffic if I need to get into a lane, and it will break for me. People have realized this. Um, and so. Now, it's not always clear that just making something which is engineered to be safer, that doesn't mean that humans are going to use it in a way which will actually improve safety. And so this is the reason why we actually need to have models, we need to have plans, we need to look at the different possibilities now and try to figure out um, what actually is the path forward that makes the most sense. And so I'll be talking about a couple different types of models today. Um, I'll talk about models that can look at the impact of autonomous vehicles on congestion and what can the technology do to make traffic flow better. I'll also talk a little bit about trying to model the impacts of autonomous vehicles on that, that, that human side, the kind of choices that people make, where people choose to live, who will have access to this, issues of equity and land use and so on. Um, then I'll, I'll, I'll talk just a little bit about some of the, I'll show some exciting slides about new opportunities for ways that we can try to manage, um, you know, manage the system, we can try to you know, maximize these potential benefits. Um, and lastly, just talk about kind of where I see the, the field of transportation modeling going um, in response to, uh, to these opportunities which are, which are coming up. So this is a slide that I, I, um, I, t I tend to give to, to students in my class and to people that I present to at different times. Um, those of us in the transportation field, we've kind of borrowed some terminology from the economists and you can kind of classify a lot of the models we work with as either the supply <laughs> side you know, or the demand side. And by supply side, I mean, I mean, how does the, I mean, how, how do the vehicles actually interact with each other and with the infrastructure? Um, what are the right traffic flow theories to be using? How do traffic jams form? 
um, how do signals work, um, how, can, you know, how, how, do, um, how can signals respond to traffic, how can we manage um, the system um, in real time. The demand side, though, is looking at the human part of it. I mean, how do, you know, how do these people that are using the system even decide to do so in the first place? And when they do decide to use the system, how? What route do they pick? What mode do they pick? Um, what sort of information do they have when they're making these choices? And autonomous vehicles, they play very well, they, they fundamentally transform both of these, actually. Um, and we'll need to make some changes to the way that we do forecasting and the way that we do planning. So the thing which makes my, my job very interesting, and by very interesting, I mean very challenging, um, is that these two things are not independent of each other. In fact, they're very heavily coupled. Um, the way that people choose to use transportation systems will dictate how congestion forms. But the choices that people make also depend on congestion. I mean, people do not you know, purposely travel in a traffic jam unless there's a very compelling reason to do so. And so you know, both of these things interact you know, with the other. Um, we have kind of this circular dependence between you know, congestion affects travel choices, which affects congestion, which affects travel choices, and so on. Um, and so we usually resolve this with um, kind of borrowing another card from the, uh, from the Economist playbook kind of an equilibrium concept, where we try to find um, some sort of steady state or some consistent state between these two, uh, kind of these two aspects of the problem. So I'll talk first about the, the supply models and some of the new ones which have been coming out at UT uh, to address autonomous vehicles. Um, and then I'll talk about demand um, in just a little bit. So um, you know, one, of the, you know, one of the reasons that autonomous vehicles have been you know, touted as, um, as, as a way of addressing congestion um, is because well, they require less following distance. I mean, and at highway speeds, well, this means that I mean, you can cram quite a few more vehicles into a, you know, a given stretch of roadway uh, before congestion sets in. Okay, this is a great idea, but how can we translate this idea into something that can be used to come up with estimates of you know, improvements in capacity, improvements in throughput, reductions in delay, and so on? So to do this, um, you know, one, what, what we need to do is change the way that we, you know, the way that we do traffic flow theory, the way that we model the interactions with vehicles among each other. And so um, this is some work that I did with one of my graduate students, Michael Levin, um, who incidentally was uh, named DSTOP Student of the Year last year. Um, he's done a you know, fantastic amount of work in this, in this area. And so one of the things that he's done is looked at what in, in um, traffic flow is called the fundamental diagram. For those of you that have taken transportation classes, you may have seen this before. It's a relationship between um, the density, that is kind of the concentration of vehicles, and the flow rate, or the, the, the rate at which they pass a fixed point. Um, and so, you know, there's been a particular shape for these that have been assumed based on um, you know, decades of just watching how human drivers interact. Well, what Michael and I did was we looked at, um, oops, we looked at um, a couple of different possibilities based on different assumed reaction times or different following distances that would be, depending on the level of technology, and again, depending on regulation. Um, you know, even if, you know, in, in principle, the technology would allow an autonomous vehicle to travel just inches behind another vehicle, we may decide from a regulatory perspective that's not something that we're okay with. Okay, that's fine. You know, regardless of the, the amount of following distance which is required, we can derive different curves that would relate um, the, the density to the flow. We can identify different estimates of capacity for roadways. We can plug these into a dynamic traffic assignment model or a simulator, and we can simulate under a variety of different conditions what would be the impacts of this on, on traffic flow. Um, here's something which may be a little bit more exciting. At least it's, it's a, a video to, to, to make sure we're, we're still awake at, as we're approaching, coming up on 4 o'clock. Um, so these videos were developed by Peter Stone, who's a colleague of mine in the computer science department. And he and I are working together on a number of projects um, that have recently started from TxDOT uh, for looking at autonomous vehicle modeling. So here's a video that, that Peter produced looking at how traffic signals operate today, um, where vehicles queue up, they wait for their turn uh, for, for green, then they get a chance to go. And if you look at this, you realize that the, the actual amount of space you know, there, there's a great deal of unused space in this intersection. Um, signals, if you look at it purely from the standpoint of throughput and usage of the roadway, are incredibly inefficient. But they're designed the way they are um, because they have to account for, um, for, for the realities of, of human drivers. Um, and if you were to continue these, um, you know, these simulations 
eventually you would see that um, the level of demand is greater than the capacity of the signal, and the queues will uh, grow very large. Okay, so here's the same thing, but with kind of a fully autonomous vehicles that now communicate ahead with the intersection. The vehicle kind of radios ahead and says, I'm coming to this intersection, I'm making a left turn. And what the system does is it identifies the first conflict-free path through the intersection. It's guaranteed to be conflict-free. Of course, this assumes 100% penetration of autonomous vehicles. This is what I mean when I say we're thinking about a fully autonomous future. Um, but you know, you'll, you'll see very close calls, but you know, the, you know, the, the system manager is responding to everything. These vehicles can be controlled very precisely. These reservations can be made with no conflict, um, with no possibility of, of a collision. We can go even crazier. I mean, we can turn this up to 11. Um, you can see even these, these systems which would be completely impossible to function with human vehicles. There's no way you could do anything in terms of signalized control to make this intersection work. But with all of these, there's hardly any delay at all. Um, some of the simulations that, that, that Peter and I have done um, have shown a reduction in delay of 10 to 100 at very congested intersections. Um, so, you know, so potentially there, there are some, some game-changing things that we can do um, if, we, you know, if we think ahead to a future where, um, you know, where all of the vehicles are, you know, are autonomous. Um, of course, from you know, the, the kind of models that we do, um, you know, we're interested not just in how a particular intersection performs, but you know, over larger regions. Um, these videos are nice, but if you try to simulate hundreds of intersections this way, you'll run out of computer time pretty quickly. So another thing that Michael Levin and I did um, is we developed um, kind of simpler models which kind of approximate the same thing but scale much, much better. I mean, we've successfully simulated um, you know, networks with hundreds and even thousands of intersections under this type of control. Um, just so we can, we can see here some, you know, some possibilities that can, that can happen. Um, and of course, you know, we can't ignore the, the changes this is going to make on how, on how humans will travel. Um, there are a number of concerns that AVs will induce new demand. Um, whether because you know, um, you know, traveling is less painful than it is before, so people don't mind commuting from further away, um, or because you know, now you've, you know, perhaps you've um, opened up travel for, for teenagers and others who previously didn't have mobility options. Um, some have talked about the possibility of, I mean, a lot of autonomous vehicles driving empty. You know, rather than paying for parking um, in, a, in a downtown urban area, well, maybe the vehicle can just kind of be your, you know, your valet, can drop you off, and then the vehicle will go somewhere else to park. Okay, maybe that's, that's great for you, but that could mean a whole bunch of extra vehicle miles traveled you know, on, on, on the system. Um, this could have inter interplay with, uh, with public transit as well. Um, it's possible that um, you know, if autonomous vehicles become widespread, um, this could have a significant impact on transit ridership. Um, and and as, as, as Lydia mentioned earlier in the morning, there are some equity issues that are associated with this. Um, you know, a lot of transit riders um, are, are you know, what are called captive users in the sense that they don't have a, a, a lot of reasonable alternatives. If transit ridership as a whole decreases because of, of higher penetration of autonomous vehicles, that may impact the resources that transit providers have um, to provide equitable access to, you know, to everybody. So, um, and this, this is kind of a very classical framework for doing you know, travel modeling and, and choice modeling. There are much more uh, realistic and sophisticated things that have been developed since then. But this will give you an idea of the kinds of choices that could be affected by you know, autonomous vehicles. Um, how many, you know, at what rate will people make trips? What destinations will people choose? Um, what mode of travel will they choose? Um, what route will they choose? And so what I'm going to show you next is kind of a, kind of a what-if scenario. Um, this is something which, um, which, which Michael and I put together, kind of a small experiment in downtown Austin, um, just to see what might happen in, in simulation. We didn't actually do things in, in, in the real downtown Austin. Um, and so what I'm going to present is kind of a, kind of a back of the envelope you know, analysis of one possibility, you know, one future possibility. Um, don't quote me on any of the specific numbers here. I mean, this is more of a back of the envelope calculation meant to show you what kind of models, what, what models can do and what sorts of things might we do. Um, as I alluded to earlier, TxDOT has um, you know, recently funded a number of projects to actually do this modeling and with much more realism and come up with much better models which are currently underway. If you come back for the symposium next year or the year after that, I can show you much more final results. But what I can show you right now is sort of a proof of concept. And so what we did is we looked at a scenario where um, people are choosing um, between you know, either taking transit or a personal vehicle. Um, the personal vehicle could either be um, kind of a, a traditional human-driven vehicle, 
or an autonomous vehicle, depending on cost. Um, and then if they were driving an autonomous vehicle, they would have a further choice. They could either park at their destination, in which case they would have to pay a particular parking fee, or they could you know, return um, to, to their origin and not have to pay anything for parking. This is the vehicle kind of going back empty. And we just <laughs> wanted to see what might happen. So we looked at kind of a, in a medium-sized network. Um, of course, whether you consider it medium-sized depends on your, your, your perspective. But for, for us, this is medium-sized. This is uh, downtown Austin. We've got about um, 600, 650 intersections, about 1,500 links. Uh, we're modeling about 63,000 trips that are occurring in this area. Um, and we've got 84 transit lines in here as alternatives that people are, are choosing among. We also divided people into 10 value of time classes because um, the, the penetration of autonomous vehicles will almost certainly you know, start from you know, wealthier people first before um, kind of percolating down to the more general market. Um, and of course, as we, as we know, the value of time you know, interfaces with all of the other travel choices that people are making. And so the, the experiment which we did is we kind of increased the number of these 10 value of time classes which had access to autonomous vehicles. So starting from zero, um, at one and two, this is where only the, peop the one or two classes with the highest value of time had access to autonomous vehicles. And then incrementally, um, adding more and more classes until 10 represents a case where you know, everybody has autonomous vehicles. Um, and speculating that this may become as ubiquitous as automatic transmissions are now. You know, whereas you know, 60 years ago, an automatic transmission was only like a high-end kind of thing. So we looked at, one of the things we looked at was the effects on traffic. Um, and so there, there's two kind of op opposing effects here. You know, one is that the more autonomous vehicles there on the road, the higher the capacity. Remember those diagrams that I showed earlier, uh, with the, the flow density diagrams. But on the other hand, the more autonomous vehicles there are, the more people there are that will be choosing to have the vehicles drop them off and you know, go back to their origins to park. And what we see is that for you know, relatively low levels of penetration, these effects cancel them, each other out almost entirely. As you get to you know, very high penetration of AVs, you know, for our little you know, kind of toy experiment, we actually saw travel times increase. You know, we actually saw um, congestion actually get a little bit worse at very high penetration rates of these, even with the extra capacity effects that happened. Uh, we also looked at uh, the effects on the predicted transit ridership. Um, and again, when there's a relatively small number of classes using these, there's not a huge effect on transit um, because the people that we gave AVs to first were the, um, the high value of time travelers, which tend not to take transit as much. Um, but then, again, as this technology becomes more ubiquitous, in our model predicted a, actually a fairly steep decline in transit ridership um, as this alternative you know, came up. So, you know, again, I'm not trying to portray these as, you know, this is exactly what's going to happen. We made a number of, of assumptions to come up with this. But this is the kind of analysis which, in my opinion, needs to be done more and developed more and thought through more um, so that, you know, right now we can try to figure out what sort of pathways make sense uh, for, for bringing this technology in. And so um, I'll close just by mentioning a few other kind of possibilities that we might have. Um, even before going all the way to the, you know, the, you know, Peter's videos where you've got you know, vehicles just running at each other all across the entire intersection, and which I'd imagine would be pretty terrifying if you were a pedestrian or cyclist. But, but you know, even, even before we get to that point, um, there are things that we can do to Im improve signal timing. I mean, if taking uh, the ideas of, um, of transit signal priority and I mean, can we do this sort of flexible signal management even with other types of vehicles as well, potentially? Um, and so there are, uh, there, there's some, some great research that is going on at UT to investigate this possibility. Um, another possibility is looking at dynamic lane reversal and at, a, you know, at, a, at a much more fine-grained scale than was previously possible. Uh, so right now, when, you, when, when, when we think about contraflow operations or dynamic lane reversal, it's a very big thing. I mean, it's the kind of decision you make, you know, you know for certain hour, for several hours, it will be this way, and then for the next several hours, it will be this way. <coughs> um, sometimes agencies actually accidentally paint themselves into into boxes this way. Um, this picture is from Interstate 90 outside of Seattle. Um, before coming here for, for for grad school, I I worked briefly at the Washington State Department of Transportation. So on um, Interstate 90, they have this. You know, there's it's an idea that sounds great on paper. I mean, there are three kind of parallel facilities. There's a set of eastbound lanes. There's a set of westbound lanes. There's a set of reversible lanes, which when, when it first opened um, was designed to allow you know, more lanes going inbound to downtown Seattle in the morning um, and more lanes outbound in the, in the evening peak period. 
Well, fast forward about 30 years, 40 years to, to today, um, if you look at the way that, that land use in has changed, there are now just as many people that live in Seattle that are commuting you know, to, to Bellevue or somewhere you know, east on the bridge as there are people that live in Bellevue commuting into Seattle. Well, what do you do? I've got this expensive facility that can only operate you know, with all the lanes in one direction or all the lanes in the other. You know, if we have autonomous vehicles, perhaps there's ability to do this in a much more agile way. I mean, we can you know, allocate capacity in, in real time. Um, we can, you know, even on, on long stretches of roads, perhaps you know, not even have the same number of lanes along the entire corridor, but it can alternate based on you know, the, observed, uh, the observed traffic flows. Uh, there's also new possibilities for kind of managing things like induced demand. Um, you know, again, if you, if you talk to an economist, their, their first reaction is to jump to pricing. We just have to price everything, and then everything will work out magically. Um, but as, as Yu Chang pointed out, I mean, incentives may be another way of managing things. Um, you know, there have been some, you know, some, some really neat results that behavioral economists have come up with that people in the transportation field are starting to kind of latch on to. Um, in, um, in, in, in Singapore, they've, they've recently launched a new system for trying to encourage people to shift their subway trips off-peak. Um, and if you look at it from a purely economic standpoint, well, the impact of any one single person on congestion is pretty small. But of course, when you have thousands of people doing something, you get big effects. But if you look at it from an economic standpoint, okay, I, I convince somebody to, to take a, to travel on the subway half an hour later, the economic theory would say I should give that person maybe about 30 cents or 40 cents. And, and, and who really is going to change their, their travel plans for that? In fact, a lot of people may even become offended. You know, is, is this how little you value my time? And I'll give you 50 cents if you leave half an hour later. What they've done is rather than giving people a reward every time, they enter you into a lottery. Um, and you know, behavioral economists have shown people actually get really excited about this kind of thing. They've also made it social. You can see how your score compares to your friends. Um, and there are a lot of people that are actually really excited about participating in this scheme. Um, and you know, with autonomous vehicles, there's a lot of possibilities for doing these things in a much more flexible way and in a much more adaptive way than, than what we had before. Um, and just as a final thing, if I can, you know, if, if I may be so bold as to predict the way that we'll see um, things evolve, I think we might see some of the traditional distinction you know, between kind of operations, kind of the, you know, the real-time control, and planning, which is this long-range strategic thinking. I think we might see these start to actually come together a little bit because a lot of the potential of connected autonomous vehicles is in how they can adapt and how they can react to things in real time. But we need to plan for that even now. You know, when we're making the decisions about you know, what, what the right paths forward are, we need to take into account how will this affect things on the day-to-day -day scale, not just on average, but on a, how will this affect reliability? How will this affect um, you know, resilience to, you know, to special events or disasters or other kinds of unexpected network disruptions which might occur. At the same time, uh, when we're coming up with these, you know, these great simulation models for, for operations, well, I mean, we, we can simulate all sorts of different things. But that doesn't mean that all of them are likely possibilities or these are things which are likely to make it through the planning process. Um, and so my prediction is we might actually start seeing these, you know, these, these two, um, paradigms for thinking about transportation start to merge together a little bit um, as, this, as this becomes more mature. So just to wrap up, um, and I think you know, all of us would agree that autonomous vehicles present tremendous opportunities, but at the same time we have to plan carefully for it. It's not, you know, it, 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 in, at least in my mind, it's not obvious that you know, things will necessarily be better um, in, a, in a fully autonomous world unless we're careful about it. Um, but there are new modeling techniques which are coming out uh, which can help guide these decisions. And I mean, there really is no time like the present to, to do this. Um, and so if there's one theme that you've got from the, you know, from, from the symposium today, um, I hope it's just a sense of excitement about, about these technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to invite the panelists to the, to the stage, to the chairs right up here to, for the Q&A part of this. Um, thank you very much. That was uh, very engaging, very interesting. Thank you. From actually, I would say three different perspectives. Uh, um, thank you. So, in terms of uh, in terms of you know questions, I want to open it up to the audience. But I have one or two questions of my own. Is there anybody in the audience at this stage that has anything in mind to ask? 
Please. Todd. So the question is, for the camera's sake, uh, what can LD LTE do and can't do in terms of capabilities to enable this? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, I certainly wouldn't say that LTE could um, solve all the problems, uh, I think, associated with uh, vehicle technology, mainly because I don't think we know all of the issues. But so when we look at you know at least the vehicle to infrastructure communication, I think it's a very strong candidate. Um, and uh, one of the you know, strengths of um, LTE is the ability to have um, integrated uh, network and uh, physical layer um, because it's a kind of a vertically integrated protocol. So a lot of the data management issues, I think LTE is very well suited to handle those challenges. And the physical layer now, I think, uh, has been quite uh, uh, updated and robust since the initial rollout, which was mainly focused on you know, broadband connectivity. But now we have many new use cases, um, device to device, um, which is also a critical safety application. Um, this was you know, pushed by the US Department of Commerce, actually. They were wanting D2D for public safety use cases um, because they felt LTE is a very robust and uh, well-deployed technology. And they also wanted the commonality with the existing LTE chipsets. So I think that's uh, another um, area where um, we can use the commonality of, of the LT protocol to serve multiple deployments, including ve vehicles. Would you be nervous about vehicle to vehicle for safety of lives? I mean, vehicle to vehicle through LTE? I, I wouldn't be more uh, worried about it compared to any wireless technology, I guess. Uh, fundamentally, wireless uh, technology um, you know, is a medium where you may not be able to guarantee 100% reliability in, in all cases. Um, but uh, I think compared to any existing technology, I think LTE certainly has the capability. And going forward, it has an evolution path towards 5G where we could even further optimize and improve the, the performance. So that brings up another related question, which is to what extent are the legal aspects, the legal ramifications of being able to do this, um, what burden does that place on the technology as well as the rollout? Are there legal ramifications? And what's it, what does it take legally to make this happen? So, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I would be very interested in knowing, uh, um, like a transportation provider like Capital Metro, how, how do you, um, I mean, because you actually have uh, <coughs> systems now that actually interface with the um, you know, traffic signals and things like that. So is there any concern about that causing uh, any impact on on safety, even something just as simple as? Sure. That's not fair asking the other panelists a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well I, not that this is all a direct answer, but I was up at Transportation Research Board annual meeting in January, and I went to several sessions on this. And from the panelists I heard up there, um, and this is probably also not fair to reference other panelists on, the, on a panel that, I re that doesn't exist today. Um, but what I heard was what, um, Stephen said is that the technology isn't the issue. The issue is the liability primarily and the profit incentive for any um, deployer is if the risks are so high that there's no potential pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, so to speak, that deployment is going to be extremely limited. And so overcoming those are, is huge challenges. For Capital Metro in the current day situation, I think our deployment is so um, and in the terms of autonomous vehicle type realm, so limited, we're not that concerned about uh, liability. And one, one idea I'd put out there and that we've thought about and that I actually was prompted by going to TRB is we have a corridor, currently an abandoned rail right of way, um, that we have identified as a potential busway, which would be completely separated from regular auto traffic. And my thought was, we've also had discussions with this, the Central Texas Regional Mobility Authority about making that a tollway. 
So there, I think, is an opportunity to try out some of this autonomous technology, potentially with both buses and cars, so that you can collect a bunch of people out in the burbs, both with buses and cars, get them into this essentially a dedicated pipeline from, say, Pflugerville into central Austin, where there's no cross-contamination with other vehicles and such. And then they turn on their automation in that pipeline. And then once they get out to the other end, it goes back over to human control. That way, you have a test bed, basically. So something like that in terms of deployment seems to make a lot of sense, rather than let these things out in the wild, so to speak. <coughs> and I, yep. Sorry, oh, please. Yeah. You know, I, I, I completely agree with, you know, with, with that. Um, and you know, going back to kind of that you know, Ram's question about how much of a role the, you know, the, you know, the legal framework will play. I mean, they, you know, ultimately that will de de define what is actually out there. But I don't think that we should view the legal things as this external process that will just kind of sure. happen. Um, and I think kind of the role for a lot of us in this room is to be trying to make the arguments for what actually makes sense in terms of, of regulation. Um, and ways to think about these things, um, and even trying to affect you know, popular opinion. I mean, the first time that an autonomous vehicle gets into an accident and kills somebody, and then it, it, it will happen. It will. You know, it's going to be front page on the news. It'll be all over the place. <coughs> and you know, even if you try to make arguments that, well, on average, they're, you know, they're safer. I mean, there's a lot of kind of human psychology things that you have to deal with. I mean, everybody thinks they're an above average driver. I mean, there, there, there are studies that have, you, actually, you actually go and ask people to rate themselves and how good of a driver they are. 80 to 90 percent of people think they're above average, which means there's a lot of people that are you know, completely deluded about how skilled they actually are at driving. Um, so there's a lot of people that would say, well, this autonomous vehicle got into a crash. Well, that never would have happened to me. And so therefore, I think these things should not be legal or they should be regulated you know, at an incredibly high level. And so I think there's an argument and a conversation that we need to be and kind of taking part in um, and trying to explain you know, what actually is happening. What, you know, what are the actual risks compared to human drivers? And, um, and so I, I, mean, I, I agree that the legal frameworks will define what's out there, but we need to be part of that conversation. Please. Yeah, John, kind of back to <coughs> public transport. You know that's how the Europeans are introducing autonomous uh, in the cities. In fact, uh, it's in transit. So there's right. a lot of experimentation going on elsewhere outside of the U.S. on transport. But your proposal about taking that pipeline is an ideal situation in a test case. In fact, I suspect that there are probably some funding available for that type of pilot study. Uh, you know, TxDOT has, uh, there's a call out now from USDOT, and I think that might fit into that category. We've had others, uh, large metropolitan areas, want to do the same thing mm -hmm. in the U.S. Transit first. Um, the vehicle manufacturers will tell you there will be failure, and there are going to be deaths. So it's you know we have to uh, not fool the public to saying that this is a foolproof system. Right. That it is going to it's going to happen one way or the other. But uh, I do think of transit as a possibility. The Europeans aren't uh, are decided. You know they've had the capability too. They've actually Mercedes. Is operating autonomous vehicles on the Autobahn for a long time until they recently had to stop it. But transit vehicles in urban areas, you can think of a lot of applications. Absolutely. Denver, for example, <coughs> and other places that have 16th Street Mall. Yeah. Set up for that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a good point. We, we actually, one of the presenters I heard was a uh, professor from Greece, and they were, he was talking about their European Union's experiment, and he noted that for liability reasons, even though they were automated, they had to have a person in the vehicle oh, yeah. to monitor. Mm -hmm. And the only crash they'd had was actually because the person in the, in the vehicle had pulled the emergency switch at the wrong time and caused it to crash. But, um, but it is an interesting point, and I think that for, for transit, and one of the reasons that um, like the SkyTrain in Vancouver, for example, is very successful is because they are autonomous, although they are completely grade separated, but the beauty of that, and no disrespect to our bus operators, but they're the most expensive part of running the exactly. system. Right. And one of the primary constraints on making transit more attractive is how frequent the service can be, and the frequency is a constraint of, of the operating costs. And so if you can use automation to drive down your operating costs and make the buses run every five minutes, for example, 
they become much more attractive. So you just got out of a union negotiation not too long ago. Why don't we bring that back? Uh, that's why I said with all due respect. <laughs> <laughs> so the comment was on funding uh, as well as what the Europeans are doing in terms of transit. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? So in terms of device to device uh, and say the technologies like Wi-Fi Direct and LTE Direct, uh, what role do you see them playing in terms of doing, being able to do multi-hop to enable this, uh, this paradigm? All right, so I, I think that's a good point. Um, one of the things that uh, we're interested in is looking at the overall ecosystem and knowing that a you know, user in a vehicle will not just you know, be reliant on the vehicle's connectivity technology, but they'll have, still have their devices, and those can be leveraged. And also, you know, as I think we saw some of the innovative applications here, taking um, smartphones as kind of the platform for doing some of this uh, communications technology for pedestrians or, or bike riders, I think that definitely has a, a big role. So I think it's important to look at how we can use the existing devices and um, leverage them to improve the overall safety of the system. Although maybe um, you, know, you can't rely on them with 100% certainty the way you could uh, rely on an integrated vehicle uh, system, but I think it's a kind of a phased approach. You could initially start with the you know, device, uh, user device and then move towards fully integrated system. Awesome. Yes. I mean, you know, any model is only as good as the inputs that it can be given. Right. Right. Um, you know, of course, you know, for under under a given set of rules, I mean, sure, I can I can model that and I can simulate that and, and see what should happen. But you know, with an emerging technology like this, I mean, it's not always clear what exactly the parameters are. But you know, in in my opinion, even in models that we understand better, we still don't understand everything about how the future is going to turn out anyway. I mean, even you know, setting aside autonomous vehicles for the second, if I'm just trying to um, you know do modeling. You know, for Austin in the future, if I knew the land use of Austin in 30 years, I could make a lot more money in real estate than I could doing what I do right now. And so, you know, whatever kind of thing I would put into a model, you know, there's, it's, it's partly assumed, but also, you know, in, in my opinion, the best way to do modeling is with different scenarios. Um, to the, the things that I don't, un to the things that I, which I can't predict or can predict only imperfectly or with some noise, um, you know, I should do some sorts of sensitivity analysis. I should kind of see how robust my findings are to different possibilities. And in fact, this might actually help, you know, help guide policy. By looking at a wider range of alternatives, I can see what kind of pathways make the most sense and, and where, should, you know, where should we try to direct um, th things like regulation to, you know, to produce the most benefit. So talking about prediction, if I were to ask each of the panelists to name one zone or one city where they believe, the first effort is going to happen, what would be their predictive guess? Is this Europe? Is this North America? Is this Asia? And where do you think this is going to happen? Hmm. Your best prediction. Globally, I'll, I'll go first. I'll take a, I would say Singapore. Because hmm. they have the authority to, to, to do certain things, <laughs> and they've already been a pioneer in terms of transportation. Yeah. So be my guess. Anybody else? Uh, as a Longhorn, I'd love to say Austin, of course, but um, what I think one of the things we're looking at, especially looking at uh, 5G, we see a lot of movement in Europe, um, and vehicles are vi connected vehicles are definitely one of the big use cases that they are very interested in looking at for 5G. So I wouldn't be surprised if you know, that uh, that would be one of the first uh, uses for the new uh, 5G networks in Europe would be for connected vehicles. You know, I, you know of course, um, my, you know, my guess is as good as anyone else's, but I, I, I would also not be surprised if it, if it was somewhere in Texas, perhaps Austin or San Antonio. The reason I say that is because, in, you know, there, there are some recent TxDOT efforts partnering with Southwest Research Institute in, in San Antonio. Um, 
you know, to actually do some prototyping you know, and do some testing, pro probably in a very controlled perspective, at least at first. But, but the momentum is there. And at least in Austin, I mean, people in Austin pride themselves on being kind of at the forefront of technology types of things. Um, I don't think it would be that much of a stretch to, to think that Austin might be one of the first cities where you see some, some small-scale demonstrations of this take place. Since there's a clarifier, are you asking about uh, like dynamic ride sharing possibilities, kind of moving away from the so 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 some have so suggested you know kind of moving away from you know, from transportation to something that I do, but maybe there will be a fleet of autonomous taxis that can take me wherever I need to go. Um, that's not something that I've modeled so far. I've got some ideas about how to do it, but it's a you know m maybe a little bit too early to. To, to, to talk about right now how exactly we, we plan to do that. But it's, it's certainly something that's on the radar. Mm -hmm. Can you hey. comment on the, the state of the art of, of simulation in terms of like combining traffic and say communication technology? So the question is on state of the art of combining communications with uh, transportation. Mm -hmm. and, and simulation. Simulation specifically. Simulation, yeah. Right. So, you know, the kind of the combining you know, traffic simulation with other kinds of simulation um, is something that's it's a very hot topic you know these days, um, and the you know, you know so far I've I've not I've I've not looked at kind of combining the you know the communication simulations and the transportation simulations in one. Some of the research that Sanjay and I are doing is kind of making some you know, some initial um, you know steps in that direction. But just the the general idea of how does a transportation simulation interact with other kinds of simulations. I mean, that, that's very much a hot topic these days. There's a lot of research being done in that area, um, whether combining it with um, you know, models of the, of the power grid, if we're looking at electric vehicles and the impacts on charging, or um, kind of looking at the interactions between um, simulating transportation and simulating the spread of information on social networks during, um, you know, say, a, you know, say a disaster, and people start you know, texting each other about it and seeing how, how those things interplay. Um, so I've, I've not seen... Um, you know, so something that's that's kind of high fidelity communications plus transportation, but I don't see any reason why, you know, that that that, that couldn't or or shouldn't happen. So I can say something on the communications side of that issue is that it's definitely um, something that's uh, needed to have a very good models. Typically, from a communication side, we typically look at snapshots of the system because we want to do extremely detailed look at the physical and Mac layers simulating the actual bits going over the air, and we can model that extremely accurately and get good results. But the question is, you know, with these transportation systems, there's correlation. It, you're not just sending it to the network, you're sending it to other users, and so you want to know, you know, how that um, you know, propagates over time. So I think having good models um, or the correlation over time of you know how the data needs to spread through a vehicle network would be something that'd be very useful for us in the communication modeling. So I think we have one last question and we can rank, wrap up. Sure. Any one last question? Last question of the day. Who wants to be the last question of the day? That is a question. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> question to the audience, yes. Um, I have a, a question with regards to transit. Um, have you looked into possibly giving the, uh, the driver a notice when he's not going to be able to make the light so he can uh, park, so he can uh, stop in a more environmentally friendly manner and save fuel? Uh, hmm. N no, but that's an interesting idea. I mean, we, what we've thought about, one of the things with the Metro Rapid system is changing the way we manage the schedule. And so with the idea being that rather than they, the driver having to adhere to a schedule, so for example, if they're running early, they need to slow down, um, is that they, it's really about gap management because we have frequent buses. So the idea basically would be 
Your job is to stay 10 minutes behind the bus ahead of you and 10 minutes ahead of the bus behind you. Uh, and to use technology on board to let them know where they are in relation to, the, the, to those two buses. But in terms of uh, with the signal system, that's an interesting suggestion, but not one we've considered as of yet. All right, let's, yeah, go ahead. let's go ahead and thank our panelists. This has been an amazing panel. Thank you very much. just have one last uh, session which what we have been doing so far fits in quite well in that session which is general discussions and some of these questions that have been raised I see as in the realm of uh, general discussions um, I, I wanted to thank all of you again for being here for the entire day this is an exciting time uh, uh, you know whenever there is a lot of uncertainty that's the time when things are exciting uh, that's the time when I, uh, I always think that we need to be planning more, we need to be more careful in the scenarios that we have been discussing earlier, the need for more scenarios, um, and the need for analyzing what the possibilities may be, putting it all out there as we move forward. Um, just three or four uh, <coughs> major takeaways that I had from this, um, and I'd like to certainly invite um, uh, any of you who uh, have any other comments, uh, one of them is really the whole idea of um, uh, data and communications. They have to work hand in glove, so to say. Um, you know, the, uh, in terms of the latency of communications, in terms of the volume of communications, it's important that these two work together in the sense of uh, communications being one part of the deal and data analysis could be locally analyzed so that only part of the information is being given and shared over the entire system. I think they, both of these are really you know, coming together in ways that, in my mind at least, before the conversations we had today, I was not seeing uh, that clearly. Uh, the whole idea of data, and uh, Mike, you refer to this data information. Data has to be converted to information and that goes forward to knowledge and wisdom. You know, that hierarchy, I think, is uh, important. Um, but going back to Steve, your co uh, points about scenario analysis, I think we need to continually think about possibilities, unintended consequences, human behavior adaptations, changes over time. I think those are, are certainly very key. Uh, we talked not too much about the legal ramifications, the policy ramifications, I think, extremely critical, the cybersecurity related issues, you know, very important. All of these privacy considerations, all of these form another um, area, if you will, uh, that uh, needs continued thought and continued discussions. Um, one of the things that uh, I feel uh, we have here at UT Austin, and um, I do tend to agree that Austin should be the place where all of these things, I mean, we, we, we have uh, academia, we have people from the wireless group, people from the transportation group, phenomenal public agencies on the transit side, the D Department of Transportation, uh, from the modeling and planning side. Uh, but one thing that I think is important for all of us, um, and which in my mind, uh, I love these collaborations to move forward at UT Austin as the idea that even within UT, even within the faculty, the transportation faculty tend to have very good connections with public agencies. With, and we have good modeling, good simulation background, good policy related backgrounds. The wireless people at UT Austin have phenomenal connections with industry, okay? And I'm not always sure that the industry and the public agencies talk. <laughs> Right, and I see the faculty here with the wireless and with the uh, transportation um, uh, really coming together and perhaps um, uh, being able to form this consortium. I do, uh, I would like to talk with um, the representatives from the industry and public agency here, not necessarily at this point, but over email uh, to see if uh, you would all like to be part of um, an advisory board that uh, would help um, and have this academia 
got public agency and uh, industry consortium going. So I think it's an exciting time, uh, and uh, I certainly look forward to that. Uh, any other comments from any of you? Any parting thoughts? I do want to give a final word to Lydia Mercado, who uh, has joined us all the way from Washington, D.C., uh, to provide any general thoughts she might have, any uh, general input she might have um, as we move forward with D.C. first. But before we go to Lydia, any other thoughts from the audience, from the last panel of speakers? <laughs> Lydia, why don't you go ahead? I'll go up front. So, mm. Wow, it's been a great learning experience for me, and I hope that it's been a great learning experience for all of you. Um, this is not my area, as I mentioned before. I was an urban planner, so but I'm always impressed by the level of um, expertise that we have in our universities and how important it is for our nation to leverage that expertise in the many, many places where, where, you, where it, it is. I am privileged to manage um, the center here uh, with Sean Rabat. I also have MIT, Berkeley, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and Florida International University. And those are only five of our 35 UTCs. So there's, we are very rich in knowledge and knowledge, and we require, I think we need all your input to really think to come to invent or to reinvent the transportation systems. As you all probably know that Secretary Fox last month unveiled um, the, um, the framework for the future uh, beyond traffic 2045, 30-year vision, and I think much of what you're talking about really fits into what he mentioned in terms of the five big quick questions. I'm not gonna go all five, but the one that I think is most closely aligned is how will we move better is one of the questions that he, we're asking for input and, and dialogue. So I urge you all to, uh, if you have time and you wanna provide your um, comments and ideas about um, how will we move better to um, go to the website of the department it's uh, dot.gov slash beyond traffic, and there's a way that you can input your ideas right there. Um, and we're looking forward to um, that conversation. Um, but uh, last some remarks, uh, thank you for hosting, uh, giving me the opportunity to come here. Now I have a better sense of, of uh, what you're doing with the federal dollars and the UTC program here at, at UT Austin. Uh, very impressive. Continue the conversation. Uh, the analysis, the technology development, uh, push the envelope, think about all those big policy questions, and, um, and then don't forget those who don't have the choices, um, and think about how we, can, can, how can we bring them along into the conversation too at the early stages so that um, we can develop um, transportation choices for everyone. And uh, with that, thank you very much, and uh, uh, continue doing great work. Thank you, Lydia. Appreciate it.